Welcome back to another Dragon Plus live stream, where we stream every Tuesday from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific, uh, talking not only about the content heading into each issue of Dragon Plus, but take the time every other week to sit down with Jeremy Crawford to go into more of the design, the continuing design of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, Jeremy, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. And uh, hi, everyone. Yes, we have had uh, a bit of a, a respite from, uh, from Dragon Plus and uh, the Design Plus episodes. We had uh, a couple of vacations, and uh, you were traveling for a bit of time. Yeah, uh, so part of that was a vacation, a wonderful vacation uh, in France, but mm -hmm. also uh, the main reason I was over there yes. was for this amazing event called D&D in a Castle, where... Wait. Where we, Sounds incredible. It was incredible. <laughs> we, we, it, the, the name is Truth in Advertising. We played <laughs> D&D in a castle, uh, and it was an inspiring experience. All of the groups had a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, the DMs all brought their A-games. Uh, it was a wonderful few days. And if, for anyone who wasn't able to go this year, I believe... The plan is for it to happen again. So how, how did this even come about? Was this an organized event? Was yeah. it sort of a mini con in a, in a way? So it, it sort of felt like a mini convention. Uh, and also while we were there, we often described it as almost like being at a D&D summer camp because, oh. because we would play D&D for eight or more hours a day. Uh, then we would all have our meals uh, together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have our breakfast together, our lunch together, our dinner together. Uh, each evening at dinner, the groups would give updates on what happened in their D&D &D game that day. And then some people who, you know, after playing for eight or, eight or more hours, who yeah. didn't have enough D&D &D yet, would then play <laughs> more D&D &D at night. So it, it, it was uh, an intense, uh, really spectacular uh, few days in this uh, castle built in the 19th century. Uh, that was really, in many ways, uh, the castle builder's fantasy about what a castle was like. <laughs> so it was not an actual medieval fort. Instead, it was you know someone in the 19th century dreaming about medieval castles, yeah. which I particularly loved because the adventure I ran uh, was an adventure I wrote specifically for the event. It was a prequel to the Curse of Strahd, uh -huh. uh, and which. By the way, my players did not know until very late in the process. It was a gothic horror game at this masquerade ball set in that very castle. I was going to ask. That yep. was a bit of the hook, right? We yes. We were using the location within the actual adventure. Yeah, my adventure location was the castle itself. And so what that meant is not only was I using the floor plan of the castle as my map, I was using the rooms in the castle often as the location for our play. Mm. So if especially it was a social encounter, I would have my players leave the D&D table and we were playing in this grand ballroom, I mean, I'm sorry, dining room, uh, and we would go to a different place in the castle and I would say, this is what you see, <laughs> and I would role play you know, NPCs in that space, they would uh, role play their characters back. Yeah. It was really marvelous. Uh, it culminated with me uh, having the players on the final day in one of the climactic battles I had the players represent their own characters on the grid, essentially. They were their own miniatures, you know, moving, you know, their 30 foot speed down this actual, you know, castle corridor yeah. uh, as they engaged in, in desperate battle uh, with this witch whom they were pursuing. Ah, I, I suppose this goes, I mean, uh, I'm making an assumption here. It was in France, but was it a French language convention? Was it English uh, it, language convention? It was an English language convention, but we had uh, players and DMs from uh, many different countries. Mm. So it was a, it was a multinational uh, uh, event. Mm. Uh, and really, again, it was wonderful. I can't recommend it enough. Super cool. Uh, so, yeah, look for that again uh, possibly next year. And uh, if you happen to be in Europe in the, the, the Paris, Parisian area? Uh, so this, this chateau uh, was near Nantes, so uh, southwest of Paris. Okay. Uh. I know very little about the French uh, country, but, uh, yeah, 
Shelley and I's honeymoon was partly in, in France. Oh. We went to Strasbourg, which uh -huh. was fantastic, and uh -huh. then we made our way up to Paris. We did not get to Paris Disneyland, but it oh. sounds like that was also Yes, I, I ended I ended uh, <laughs> my vacation at Disneyland Paris, and that was really wonderful. And I'm, I'm already a Disneyland fan, and that park blew me away because of just the... Uh, Disney parks all have an, an amazing attention to detail, but mm -hmm. that park in particular yeah. uh, was spectacular in just the little touches of beauty uh, in the park itself. So basically, our, if someone asked me, what was your favorite ride at Disneyland Paris? I would say the park itself. Our yeah. favorite part was just walking around <laughs> uh, because... You know, just a great example, rather than having an Alice in Wonderland ride where you get in a caterpillar and, you know, ride around and look at things, <laughs> there was instead an Alice in Wonderland labyrinth uh, that you just walked through. Mm. So it, it, in many ways, made you feel like you were walking around in this fantasy uh, rather than just observing it. That was one of my first college jobs was working at an amusement park over the summer at Great America in Chicago. And I sympathize for the rest of my life for the costumed characters working in the summer heat. Bo boiling alive <laughs> in, yeah. inside their outfits. In the park, you know, great smiles, uh, interact with the kids. As soon as they step behind the scenes and they take those masks off, oh man, you can yeah. see like this is not a physically easy job in the Chicago summer heat. Yeah, but. yeah. The one, uh, so... Uh, People, people, of course, tuned in to hear about D&D design uh, and, and to have uh, some of their questions answered. One thing I'll say real quick following up on uh, the trip is often we talk about when you're designing things for D&D, adventures, campaigns, you're trying to think of, like, what's a cool location? What's a cool story I could tell? Uh, loot liberally from the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you can travel to these places yourself or look them up on the internet, there are amazing resources uh, all around us. I am a big fan of using floor plans of real world castles, cathedrals, mm -hmm. libraries. I've even used uh, maps of train stations and presented them as dungeons. My players never know that they're actually running around in Grand Central Station in New York, yeah. uh, because to them it's just spaces that I describe as a dungeon. Uh, but there are uh, maps galore online uh, already uh, available for you to use. And even better, if you've been to the place, yes. you then actually have a sense of what that space feels like. Yeah. And so as a DM, your descriptions become far more vibrant, they become more convincing, uh, more immersive. So DMs, loot. I, I heartily concur. Uh, I've, I've used that in several campaigns, uh, especially if the, it, I've used it where the players also have that similar understanding of the space so that you don't need to put a map down and you know where everything is. We had a campaign back in high school where we're using our uh, high school as the castle, mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. And in that way, everyone knew how to communicate. Well, I go here, I go to this area. You know, you break the wall of the cafeteria, that's fine. But you, you know where you are in relation to everyone else, and you can more easily split the party that way if everyone understands the physical space that they're, they're playing in, so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I saw questions already come in. Unearth Arcana for the month of July. Where are we with that? Let's see. I believe while I was out of the country, an announcement went out that we will there will be an Unearth Arcana this yes. month. Uh, it just got delayed because not only was I on vacation, but as often happens, July was <laughs> essentially the vortex of vacation <laughs> in the department. Yes. Uh, we also uh, have, as you all know, an announcements brewing uh, for next week. We've been uh, kind of, yeah, rolling through announcements. Uh, we had a couple of products announced on Monday, the ABCs of D&D, the 123s of D&D, uh, the Core Rule gift set, and alternate covers have been announced. Uh, so, so yes, uh, I guess expect more in the in the days as well. So yeah, including Unearthed Arcana. So, so the, yeah, there's your announcement. The Unearthed Arcana will be coming later yep. in the month. Yeah, we uh, we will be getting into the Giant Soul Sorcerer one last time this episode. We also want to make sure that we have time to answer your questions. So let me just uh, make the <laughs> another announcement now. If you do have a question for uh, for Jeremy. 
for the show, please just preface it with question in the chat, and we will make a concerted effort to get to it this time for realsies. Uh, speaking of which, we had a question last time in chat referring back to Unearthed Arcana. Poor Knight had asked, is there an official quote-unquote end of life for Unearthed Arcana items? Stuff that has been, ah, is it IE and EG, I love the differentiation. EG, stuff that has been discarded and is no longer being considered for any near future use. So there's no, well, okay, there, two part answer. Uh, the official end of life mm -hmm. for something in Unearthed Arcana is that thing appearing in a D and D book? So uh, that that is that's as official as it gets. That when it once it appears in a D and D book, uh, that means whatever version was previously in Unearthed Arcana yes. is truly and completely obsolete. So, for example, we uh, had uh, a year or more ago um, a version of the Scout. Mm -hmm that was an Unearthed Arcana. Then the Scout appeared in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. At that point, the Unearthed Arcana Scout uh, was truly and officially gone. Anything else that we have shown in Unearthed Arcana but is not yet in an official product, some of it we're still experimenting with, you can often assume that if something appeared a year or more ago and still has not appeared in a book, there is a good chance uh, you're not going to see it again. Or if you do see it again, it's going to be very different from the last time you saw it. Uh, but really, the only kind of official, that thing is truly dead, yeah. is when it is basically <laughs> resurrected, uh, phoenix-like, in one of our books. Otherwise, it's in a laboratory under the, the castle being experimented on, yeah. at, like with yeah. the Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I think good rule of thumb is if it's been a year or more mm -hmm. and you have seen, you know, no, no peep, uh, you haven't heard a peep. I don't know how you see a peep. You haven't heard, heard a peep. <laughs> Comic book dialogue. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, you haven't heard a peep and mm -hmm. you haven't seen... Uh, any sign of that thing, there's, you're pretty safe to assume the version that you saw is also gone. It has ridden off into the sunset. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for Unearthed Arcana material that appears in D&D Beyond, the same holds true. It's Unearthed Arcana material in D&D Beyond until it becomes official, and then it's no longer accessible as UA material, and it is accessible as that official material release. Right, so. yep. Yeah, it, get it gets phased over. Yes. Uh, one more quick question. Banjo Wind uh, had asked, where, where are the missing Dice Camera episodes 32 through 60 for the Dice Camera Action, uh, Dice Camera Action podcast? Uh, those are being worked on now. Uh, so we made the decision to convert Dice Camera Action into a podcast for added enjoyment and another platform to be able to listen to it. Uh, we have them uh, for, I think, 60 to the current, and from 1 to 231. Uh, we are working on the remaining episodes as soon as those are finalized. We'll put those up, and they'll be available uh, all the way through uh, for, for everyone else. So yes, if you uh, have not subscribed yet, please do consider subscribing to the Dice Camera Action podcast on uh, iTunes or wherever else you get your podcast feeds. All right, uh, so we want to make sure we save some time for questions, but so that we uh, do get through the giant soul sorcerer, why don't we finish uh, the discussion of the giant, mm -hmm. and then we'll move on to, to some of your questions. So, uh, oh, you know what? Speak of the devil. Refreshing my screen so that I can see us live. Oh, there we are. <laughs> 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 All right. So, so where were we last time? All right, so last time we got up, if my memory is correct, and, it, and I, I'm, I have a slight doubt, it's possible that we all that, might be reiterating all, all that DMing in, in a castle <laughs> and time in France might have scrambled my brain. Uh, but uh, Oh, you poor thing. I know, <laughs> this is a high-class problem. All right, so I believe we got up to Rage of Fallen Astoria, and which means we have already discussed the different features that give you a special 
trait based on the type of giant that you're associated with, whether that's cloud giant, fire giant, frost giant, etc. So you get at 14th level now to Rage of Fallen Astoria, and this feature is shared by all sorcerers of this subclass. Here, you gain this ability basically to pump yourself up. Um, for some reason, I imagine uh, you're so, you're, you are being inflated like a giant balloon. Um, <laughs> and you, you can make yourself larger. Uh, this transformation lasts for one minute. Uh, and uh, I have put in uh, that it ends early if you die or if you are incapacitated. Often, when I am developing features for whether it's a class, a monster, or something else, if there is some kind of transformation ability, I will almost always make sure that there is a shutoff mechanism, whether it's death, incapacitation, or something else, that does not require the user of that ability to do something. Uh, in this case, one of the reasons for that is I wanted to make sure this person wouldn't like expand, you know, getting larger and larger, fill up the hallway, get knocked out, and then you have problems with like your friends can't even get through, although it is kind of funny imagining um, Bob, uh, the sorcerer, <laughs> knocked out, filling up uh, the hallway. But I, I think that's a good name for a giant, fill up the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay, go, go sit in the corner. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> All right. So, uh, there's this shutoff mechanism. And you will see throughout the game, by the way, that the most common shutoff mechanism is uh, being incapacitated. This is intentional, that it is the game's main shutoff mechanism, um, particularly because there are multiple conditions in the game that reference being incapacitated. I often refer to the incapacitated condition as a meta condition, uh, because it, you, almost nothing in the game just makes you incapacitated. You are almost always incapacitated because of another condition that is delivering it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are many different ways for you to be incapacitated. It is our catch-all way of basically saying, you're, you got a timeout. Uh, you, you're not able to uh, take any action, a reaction, and remember, when you can't take an action, that always means you also can't take a bonus action, because a bonus action is just a type of action. So anything in the game that deprives you of your ability to take an action also deprives you of your ability to take a bonus action. Uh, so again, you see, in, you see incapacitated as a shutoff mechanism all over the place, very, very intentional. All right, so you get, you get all these benefits. Your, your hit points increase, your reach increases, uh, Something I added in, actually now my mind is, okay, so it's been enough weeks <laughs> since I worked on this. Either I increased the reach when I was developing this, or I increased the speed. Uh, and there were a few tweaks I made here to make sure that there was usefulness in this feature that was not only combat related. I wanted to make sure that a sorcerer would have some reasons to use this even outside combat. One easy way of doing that is making you move faster mm -hmm. uh, because that's, that, that can be useful in a variety of situations, like a chase, for instance, where suddenly you grow larger and you're taking these larger steps and you can try to chase down uh, the person you're pursuing. Uh, you also have advantage on your strength checks and strength saving throws. And then you gain a bonus to uh, the damage rolls of your melee weapon attacks. This bonus equals your constitution modifier. Remember that this subclass uses constitution uh, an unusual amount, and that is a, an intentional part of this design for this sorcerer to be all about uh, pumping up their constitution. Uh, and this is an ability that once the sorcerer uses it, it has to be recharged by a short or a long rest. I wanted to pause one moment on a rules writing thing. You'll notice in the second to last bullet in Rage of Fallen Astoria, the, the phrasing, you have advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. 
We sometimes have written rules like this in the past and have written it as you have, a, and have written it like this. You have advantage on X checks and saving throws. In this case, X equals strength. The reason why we haven't done that here is many times when we've done that, people will then ask, so do I have advantage on strength checks and all saving throws? Mm. Because it's not always clear to people that in a sentence constructed like this, that oh. the ability strength is referring not only to the ability checks, but also to the saving throws. It's a bit of an each shoots and leaves situation. Yes, exactly. Okay. So because of that, um, you know, I've talked about before that in rules writing, you have to try to be as clear as you can be because mm -hmm. the rules, uh, you know, they're a tool of the DM, but that tool needs to be as clear as possible. Uh, we realized it is best for us to repeat the name of the ability so it's absolutely clear to people this, this advantage applies only to strength saving throws, not all saving throws. So that's, that is Rage of Fallen Astoria. Its story, because again, every, every feature needs to start with a story, really is not only are you getting abilities that are reminiscent of of these various giants from your earlier features, but now you can become essentially a mini giant. Mm -hmm. um, which <laughs> a, a mini giant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gi yes. Giant desk. <laughs> <laughs> so, which leads us to the ultimate ability uh, for the giant soul sorcerer, the blessing of the All Father, which yes. is a, a nod to Odin uh, in its name. And here, your constitution increases, and this is one of the cases in the game where we let you go above the, uh, 20, the 20 maximum that is normally in the game. Mm -hmm. This allows you uh, to go up to 22. And then there's this little bit of craziness. You can now use Rage of Fallen Astoria, that previous ability, twice between rests rather than uh, only once between rests, but no more than once on a turn. Mm -hmm. If you use that feature while under its effects, it increases your size again, your hit points again, your reach again, and your walking speed again. You'll notice that uh, it does not increase uh, the bonus to damage, but what this does mean is if you were a medium creature and you used Rage of Fallen Astoria to become large, uh, now you can use Blessing of the Allfather to now become Huge, mm -hmm. and that's why I refer to I refer to this as crazy. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if this if this survives uh, playtesting and your feedback, uh, because getting that large in certain dungeon environments uh, gets bonkers. Uh, because it, partly you become a, a walking wall. Fill up the hallway. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> see now it's sticking in my head. Yeah, and we're gonna have to have the giant soul, the giant soul sorcerer named Philip, Philip the, hallway. the hallway. Yeah. Come on, it's a great giant wow. name. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, you are a walking wall. As I've discussed before, when we were talking about centaurs and minotaurs, uh, that's when, the joke I was angling for uh, yes. for increasing your size <laughs> from medium to large. Is when you when you get when you get larger, there are a number of. Uh, hidden benefits. One of the biggies is if you have any uh, any kind of aura-like effect mm -hmm. that radiates out from you. It's essentially using your size as its point of origin. If your size increases, that means then the aura increases as well. And that advantage can be huge. At some point, all of you listening, I recommend take take some take a medium miniature, a large miniature, and a huge miniature. Put it, on your, put it on a grid at home, then say, pretend, all right, my guy has a 10-foot radius fire aura. Count the number of squares around the medium person, mm -hmm. then count around the large person, then count around the huge person, <laughs> and you will see, actually, what an amazing benefit it is simply to increase your size with those effects that change in size based on your own size. It can be crazily advantageous. And the radius, it's not, unless I'm hearing it wrong, it's not origi originating from the center 
of the figure. It's originating from the edge of the figure, and so it's going so out that way? That is a great question. So it depends on the wording of the ability. Mm -hmm. So most aura-like effects will say things like, um, people within 10 feet of you have advantage on, say, their wisdom saving throws. Mm -hmm. Now, in that case, because it's within 10 feet of you, mm -hmm. you are basically a variable. Right. If you are a medium creature, mm -hmm. well, the number of squares that are within 10 feet of you is actually a different number of squares than is within 10 feet of a large creature right. or a huge creature. Right. Uh, now, let's say instead an ability said, you create, uh, centered on yourself, mm -hmm. a sphere uh, that is 10 feet in diameter mm -hmm. or 20 feet in diameter or whatever, or that the sphere has a 10 foot radius. Now that area of effect is not relative to your size. Mm -hmm. It has its own size, and so it, th at that point it doesn't matter what your size becomes, it will always have its fixed diameter. But again, if the ability radiates out from you, yeah. then if your size changes, then that, that effect also changes mm -hmm. in size. But, <laughs> so in theory, there are effects where if it's centered on you and you become large, huge, it doesn't actually, ever go beyond yeah, yeah, your yeah. So, uh, perimeter? So if you have an effect that that uh, that creates, say, a something with a 10-foot diameter, yeah. a sphere with a 10-foot diameter, and then suddenly you become huge in its midst, basically like you're sticking your head up right. out of your own effect. Right. Well, now actually it would be down here. You'd be so big. Uh, and, and, I'm imagining it was like a hoop skirt right. you know, that's sort of around you. And the point of the question isn't to be a smartass, although I think right. it's funny to be a smartass. It's when you're making these design, mm -hmm. when you're writing the design, the language of the design does have applications and, and impacts. Absolutely. So you have to be careful with the, the language of this. Oh, things. yes, because if a rule says this effect uh, affects everyone within 10 feet of you, mm -hmm. that is a different rule than one that says this creates a sphere with a 10-foot radius. Because again, that sphere with a 10-foot radius has a fixed size, whereas 10 feet of you, that's relative. See, I wish there was a uh, sort of a math curriculum that used D&D &D story problems. Mm, I would have mm -hmm. been far more invested yeah. in <laughs> in my math classes, yeah, and hey, we could come up with uh, with, with these cases. Oh, I, I think this is one of the reasons why many schools have actually started well, to have D and D clubs and even uh, you know classes yes. uh, that where they they use some of this material to help people understand geometry, uh, different you know math problems, uh, improve their their language skills. For me, it was language definitely as a kid. I remember mm -hmm. that. As far, and in the next issue of Dragon Plus, we'll be talking to some of those uh, schools and programs that are, are making use of that. So yeah. my little pitch for, for Dragon Plus. So uh, now we have some questions from last time we didn't answer. We do. I, I do want to jump onto one of them because it is specifically about the giant soul sorcerer. Yes. So we, we've, we've now gone through the giant soul sorcerer. Uh, just in time for another Unearthed Arcana coming yes. out soon. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so from last time, we had second level NPC ask, is it intentional that Rage of Fallen Astoria changes the approach of this subclass to combat so late in the game? So uh, this actually ties into... I in put emphasis in a very weird way in that sentence. Oh. The approach <laughs> of the subclass to combat so late in the game. So uh, that ties into something I was just talking about. That's why I made sure that Rage of Fallen Astoria had some appeal even outside combat because I didn't want you to suddenly get an ability that was really going to be only advantageous to you if, let's say, you were a melee combatant because not all of the giant options in the subclass are melee-oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why Rage of the of Fallen Astoria is sort of a, is a toolkit. It certainly does have uh, a a melee benefit in here, but it has other benefits as well. And one thing I would say, whenever you're evaluating a bit of design, and, and I would say this actually whether you're, you're designing something, you're homebrewing, or you're just reading something in a D&D book or on something on the DMs Guild, and you're, and, you're, and you're trying to suss out, is this thing 
hitting the target or is it good? Beware when you see something like this, Rage of Fallen Astoria, that has multiple parts. Beware of thinking it's only useful if you are able to use every single one of the parts all the time. Uh, that, that can be kind of a, an optimization fallacy that sometimes people will think, well, unless I am using every one of these bullet points, every time I use this feature, the feature is useless. No, the point is, if you're getting any benefit from the feature, and even more importantly, you're having a good time using the feature, the feature is working for you. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. If, in contrast, none of these various features uh, are really giving you something fun, some new twist, then really the feature does have a problem. Mm. Uh, but any time we have one of these, these features with multiple parts, and each of those parts can give you a benefit all on its own. For example, you increasing your walking speed, you're going to get that benefit. I mean, it, even if you never use this melee weapon attack benefit in Rage of Fallen Astoria, your reach is increasing, your walking speed is increasing, your hit points are increasing, one of these benefits doesn't suddenly <laughs> drop away because you're not getting the use of one of these other benefits. Right. And you know, just having more hit points in some cases can be mm -hmm. super useful just to you know, survive longer. Keep in mind also that reach is not only relevant to melee attacks. Reach is also relevant to any spell that has a range of touch because suddenly you can touch someone even <laughs> further away. Um, so there, this is... This, a feature like this can be a little harder sometimes to evaluate because you are looking at all of these different angles. Uh, but again, uh, also this is why I made sure to flesh this feature out a bit more when I was developing it to make sure it wasn't so one note because I didn't want you to get to 14th level and get a feature that it was just sort of like, thanks but no thanks. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure you're getting something no matter which of these giant types you picked back at first level, there was something in Rage of Fallen Astoria that you were going to find useful. Uh, let's move on to a couple of other questions. Uh, we've got uh, a couple more grab bags from last week before we get into a couple that uh, have been coming through to the chat this week. And thank you again for your questions. <laughs> no, no, not Philip the Giant. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I have to say to that just and scene. <laughs> there he is. But well done, Pelham. <laughs> ah, yeah, that, that leads into one of the other questions about... Uh, <laughs> proud uh, options, most least proud. Uh, but let's ask, uh, Robin Laura asks, was Asmodeus, Asmodeus not put into Morning Cannon's Tome of Foes because he's too powerful, or is he being saved for another product? So there were several of the uh, Lords of Hell we did not include in Morning Cannon's Tome of Foes uh, because of how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. uh, we might decide at, at a later point to feature them, uh, but the cast of Infernal Foes who we've put in the book, uh, we sort of thought of as like the first line of them that you would fight, <laughs> and then maybe you would get to the others. Asmodeus in particular is in an interesting space because in some D&D worlds, he is actually elevated in power to the point where he's considered a god. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, we generally don't give stats for, for, <laughs> for creatures who have made it to god status. We have, of course, given uh, stats for um, gods in an avatar form. I mean, we mm -hmm. did that in The Rise of Tiamat, where you can fight a, an avatar of Tiamat. Uh, but but right. good luck if you ever try to face a god <laughs> in their true form. Um, you know, that, that is the kind of thing that a 20th level uh, group of characters could certainly attempt uh, with uh, very uh, little chance of succeeding, uh, but would certainly make for a thrilling tale. Wasn't that the old story about uh, deities and demigods that uh, Gary Gygax had statted out these these gods and un unbeknownst to him, his players would immediately try and yes, take yep. them down. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. The original <laughs> deities and demigods was essentially a monster manual of gods, 
and there were groups who basically went on god hunts. Read, read that as a monster manual <laughs> yes. as opposed it's like, to a there are, hit, there are hit points in here. <laughs> <laughs> that means we can slay them and take their stuff. If it bleeds, we can kill it, yep. to yep. quote uh, Dutch. Um, yeah, I was thrilled to see Gary. Gary on is my guy, so I was glad to see him in Morning Kings. Uh, Raving Raj asks, uh, what design niches do you think are left for new classes in the future? So we were intentionally uh, pretty comprehensive in the player's handbook in terms of hitting the major fantasy archetypes for D&D with the classes that we provided. So at this point, the, the space left for classes is, tends to be very niche. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have explored through an Earth Arcana uh, version of, uh, of an artificer. Uh, we had the mystic uh, who, you know, p many people also think of as the scion. Mm -hmm. uh, both certainly legitimate paths for us uh, to go down, but also a great example of being very niche uh, because uh, the scion and uh, the scion slash mystic and the artificer do not have the same archetypal weight as the wizard, right. the fighter, the rogue, <laughs> the cleric, etc. Uh, but still worth exploring. Uh, those classes in particular have roots in some uh, classic D&D worlds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it would be natural for us to continue kind of poking and, and experimenting. But as I've said before, uh, getting a class right so that it feels at home among the classes that are already in the game is a long process, uh, not one we are in any rush uh, to do. Um, so, you know, keep your eyes out. Uh, but you're far more likely to see more subclasses for the classes that exist than brand new classes. Uh, that kind of leads into the next question from Vivid Ardent. Could prestige classes return? Uh, and then the question continues, but specifically for use on uh, PCs picking up templates, like, say, Vampire, Lycanthrope. So uh, the, I'll answer in two parts. Mm -hmm. First, uh, prestige classes are very unlikely to make it into the game uh, any time over the last five years we have done any kind of exploration with them. They have not proven to be very popular. Uh, Prestige classes also kind of got gobbled up in 5th edition by subclasses. Um, now, when it comes to transformative templates, like becoming uh, a, a slightly different type of creature, you know, being shaped by some kind of magic, uh, that sort of template uh, is something the game already has a little bit of in the monster manual where you have, here's how you make a half dragon, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that door is already open in the game and is certainly a door we could walk through again uh, in our future design. So I would say, in summary, uh, you're more likely to see uh, a sort of template approach in the future for things like the half dragon uh, than you are to see uh, prestige classes. Okay. Uh, because again, the class design space is already um, very nicely filled uh, by classes and subclasses, uh, and there are a whole lot more uh, subclasses we could explore uh, in the future, as people have not only seen in Unearthed Arcana, in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, but also that people have gotten to see uh, in uh, the Happy Fun Hour. Uh, great. Uh, so now it's the real challenge, not answering the questions, but uh, deciphering my handwriting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> For questions that have come in. Uh, Actually, during in some the... cases your handwriting is pretty good. Yes, but this is me desperately trying to write well, so you can <laughs> only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> what less effort would yeah. would actually uh, entail here? Uh, so we had questions about uh, sorcerers. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, so how about we start? How about we start at the bottom and go up? Oh, and so sure. for those of you watching, what Bard has done is he's transcribed some of your questions poorly uh, from. Uh, the chat, uh, keep them up. I'll see how many of these questions I can get through before we hit uh, 3 o'clock. So Acacia Roberts, it's right here, asks, uh, will there continue to be new player character races every so often? Uh, oh yeah, there's a good chance we will, we will 
basically always be tinkering with new uh, races, partly because the D&D &D multiverse uh, is uh, brimming with different peoples, mm -hmm. uh, many of whom uh, could turn into a playable form at some point. Um, races also are uh, pretty non-disruptive as a form of game design for D&D. &D. Um, a race often has a pretty light footprint for your character. Class, uh, if, you, if you think of your character as um, sort of like being this bucket with different things you pour in, most of what you're pouring in is class, mm -hmm. um, and race is a, is a bit less. Uh, so races, that's why you've seen us often coming out with races because there, there's also kind of great aesthetic payoff for race. Like people yeah. are like, I want to play, you know, a lizard person. And it's like we can deliver that without the same risk of, <laughs> and here's a whole new class right. that may destabilize the entire game. <laughs> uh, it's fun to fill the cantina. Yep, and uh, see all the different uh, folks there at the, yeah. at the costume party. It's and and for us. yeah, because people people like to change the look of their characters. Uh, they like to be from different parts cool. of the world, uh, uh, etc. Uh, we've got. Um, do we like this one? Check your whispers. Okay, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong account, uh, Obo Crazy. But I will jump over there now. I was. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Do -do 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 -do. Uh, while I Here, let's do the ah let's do that one. Yes, so uh, I'm going to jump into some other questions, but uh, <laughs> AK318 asks: With the half giant sorcerer, does that mean that the sea and stone sorcerers that were in Arthur unearthed Arcana before are now considered dead? Uh, no, um, they actually both the. The, like the stone sorcerer in particular uh, definitely had its fans. Uh, we, we might experiment with it some more. Uh, us experimenting with the giant soul sorcerer certainly doesn't erase that sorcerer from existence. But as I said earlier, the longer, the, the longer it is since the Unearthed Arcana came out uh, and you haven't seen some new version in a book or elsewhere, uh, the more and more likely that the version you saw before is defunct. Uh, so, yes, sorry. <laughs> I was on the wrong account, Obo Crazy. I'm on the right account now. I have all of your questions. Thank you so much for collecting them from the chat. Uh, so, we have quite a few that all we right. can go through here. Um, ba -ba -ba. We've got that. Oh, just uh, do you want me to just start picking? Sure. All right, pick one at random. Uh, keep, keep going, keep going. All right, um, here, let's do that one. Lazorn. Lazorn asks, do you think that the Happy Fun Hour subclasses have a higher chance to make it into the game? Oop, thanks to oh, I just dropped it here. Uh, thanks to their exposure to the community, is there a risk of bias? Uh, the something being in the happy fun hour, actually, that has no bearing on whether the thing will appear in the game. Uh, the happy fun hour is a experimentation space uh, where mm -hmm. Mike uh, explores ideas uh, with, with those of you who watch. Uh, if something particularly compelling comes from that, uh, we will certainly... Uh, expose it to more people through Unearthed Arcana, to our NDA playtesters. Uh, that material has to go through the same process that everything else has to go through. So basically that is not sort of a shortcut uh, for something getting into the game. No, uh, but I will say, uh, sort of apropos of the question in a way, it, it is a good time to, again, uh, sort of uh, distinguish, I think, the two shows as it pertains to the design process in, in, uh, in the brand. Uh, Mike's Happy Fun Hour is a great ideation space. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to see where concepts come about. And then uh, we talk, uh, Jeremy talks about sort of the continuing design process, the iteration, the refinement, the, the specificity of language and, and things of those natures. So, uh, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but we felt it was uh, good and important to have the two shows follow one another for that very reason. Right. So that we can help show you more of a design process from very beginnings all the way through Unearthed Arcana and, and beyond to, you know, the finished, finished book. Yeah. But there certainly is a chance that something that has 
that has bubbled up in the happy fun hour would, would make it uh, into a product at a later time, but again, only after it has gone through all of our regular processes. Uh, we've got, I'm going down from the beginning. Just hit me with them. Okay, all right. Just, 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 just find a question you like and hit me with it. Uh, Word or Excel? Your preference. Microsoft Word or Excel? That between a spreadsheet and a in a, I don't know. In a word processor. It was, was a question here. Wow, uh, I use them both <laughs> all the time. All right, next question. Uh, next, oh, we'll go from the. Uh, doo -doo -doo. How many people? Uh, uh, it's kind of a business question. I don't know that we yep, want to yep. get into numbers. Game questions. The game design. Any yeah. chance that we might see more small scale, small scale chronomancy in the future? Uh, things like the mending cantrip and rusting weapons. Absolutely. Things that uh, there. And not, and when I say absolutely so quickly, I don't mean specifically the, you know, these effects. What I mean to say is we are always exploring new things for magic to do in the game, uh, as well as other non-magical features uh, to do in the game. Uh, so in, in some ways, it's sort of the sky is the limit. If you've seen us explore, particularly in non-combat ability at some point, uh, it's likely we'll explore similar things later uh, in the game. I've seen this one a couple of times. Uh, is the cone from the fear spell maintained while con concentration on it lasts? All right, hey, this is a great chance for us. Let's <laughs> open up the player's handbook. All right. As yep. I, as, for those of you who've watched before, as I say, anytime I, anytime I get a, a specific rules question, my first step is break out the book. Um, <laughs> Because even if it is something I wrote myself, I have to make sure I'm referring to the real thing and not my memory of it. Let's break out the book is a great subtitle for Sage Advice. Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's break it out. Let's take a look. All right. So, you project a phantasmal image of a creature's worst fears. Each creature in a 30-foot cone must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or drop whatever it is holding and become frightened for the duration. Uh, so, uh, what what is... Continuing for the duration is that frightened effect, not the cone itself. All right. Uh, oh, I had, there was a great one up here oh, that I just I loved so much. Um, oh, I, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. I, oh, here we go. Uh, DZ Coin Phil Trader asks, are there any rules or conventions of play you've seen become common in the wider D&D community that aren't printed in the core rules? Like when I think of critical hits, I don't think those were ever part of first edition D and D, but clearly became canon through community play over time. Yeah, there. So in early D and D, there there were kind of versions of that, mm -hmm. but but definitely the community's enthusiasm for it over time made it have a more a more prominent place in the rules. Uh, in current D&D play, something I often see uh, in the broader community that is not in the rules is uh, this idea that rolling a 20 on like an ability check means mm -hmm. automatic success uh, or rolling a 20 on a saving throw means automatic success. Neither of those things are true in the rules. Uh. Uh, rolling a 20 causes you to hit automatically on an attack roll mm -hmm. and rolling a 20 has a special effect on a death saving throw. Right. That's it. Uh, everywhere else in the game, when you roll a d20, a 20, other than being a big number, yeah. has no special meaning. <laughs> uh, it's just, you take that big number, you add it to the modifier, and you see, did you hit the DC? But many tables, they have this idea that if they rolled a 20, certainly they succeeded. That's my table. Yeah, That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, that is a very common yeah. house rule. And what's fascinating to me is it's, it's a house rule that many groups use, and they don't even realize it's a house rule. Mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a kind of phantom rule that like haunts their game. And it's fine. To be clear, uh, if I point out that something like this is not actually a rule of the game, that is not me saying you're doing it wrong. If you're having a great time, if, if that way of playing the game is making your group happy, you're playing D&D the way it's meant to be played. Mm -hmm. But it's important to make a distinction if you're planning on doing design for the game, 
uh, uh, whether mm. you know it's for an official product or for the DMs Guild, to have it clear in your head the difference between what people do in their own play and what's actually a rule of the game. And so again, to reiterate, there is no rule that says rolling a 20 on an ability check or a saving throw, unless it's a death saving throw, <laughs> is an automatic success. Ah, good to know. Uh, similarly, rolling a one yeah. on uh, an ability check uh, or a or a regular saving throw all, doesn't mean automatic failure. You might have a large enough modifier uh, that you actually end up hitting the DC. Uh, as an aside, really quickly, when you were in France, culturally, were there any changes to the game or the rules or the play at the table that you encountered? So most of my players were um, American, and but I did also have two players who were Swiss. Mm -hmm. So they're, it, we were basically playing the same D&D &D, uh, that we play here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see. We've got a couple other questions. Um, about the DMs Guild or... You choose. Okay, I like this you, one then. Okay, yeah. Because uh, I'm, I'm, I love the DMs Guild as a platform. Uh -huh. uh, I, God, I wish this had been around uh, years ago. Uh, has the DMs Guild affected uh, your design processes and the company design processes in general? Uh, Did the very existence of it? Yes. How, how if, if so, does it impact so, us? So one of, the, one of the ways in which the DMs Guild affects our design is it helps us focus on creating the things that we think either because of what our gut tells us, but also because of what surveys tell yeah. us and playtest feedback tells us, it lets us focus on those things that we think will make the largest number of D&D &D players happy. I say that relative to the DMs Guild because the DMs Guild is a fantastic place to explore some niche things for D&D &D that there is certainly an audience for, but it might be something that not as many people uh, would want as, say, something that ends up in one of the core books. Mm -hmm. uh, so the DMs Guild makes it so that this wonderful array of things can be explored for the game. Um, and so it kind of meets that hunger for, I want to see this, and I want to see that, I want to see that, without there being pressure for official products mm -hmm. to serve all of those varied desires. Yeah. Because honestly, if we tried to cover the same range in official product, uh, the official books would start becoming uh, overburdened. Uh, they would be shooting off in so many different directions. And so I love the synergy between uh, the, the books, which are for the sort of broadest D&D &D audience mm -hmm. possible, and then the, the DMs Guild, which can again serve all these, the, the wonderful variety of tastes mm -hmm. that D&D &D players have. Uh, do, do, do. do you have a setting other than the Forgotten Realms that's your favorite? Uh, my favorite setting to DM uh, is my own setting, uh, which, <laughs> which I've been using for about 25 years. As I've mentioned before, uh, my setting is the world that uh, Barovia original, originally came from, mm. and there are actually bits of my setting uh, in Curse of Strahd. Uh, and so that... Because it's my own and I know it inside and out, it's crazy easy for me to DM in that setting. But that said, I have enjoyed DMing in the Forgotten Realms, in Dragonlance, in Greyhawk, in Spelljammer, uh, in Mistara. Uh, I could go on. I mean, I've been playing uh, and DMing D&D for so long, it's sort of like I have wandered uh, into <laughs> all sorts of, <laughs> of different worlds. Uh, I like this question. Uh, I have players who don't like how monks are included in the story of the Forgotten Realms. I, I, I'm assuming that means a bit of the crossover of, of, of uh, monks uh, as depicted in movies and, and uh, in history being in a, a medieval fantasy setting. Uh, what can I... Oh, uh, oh I lost it now. Uh, oh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, you have to hold your finger on it so, it so it won't scroll. That's what I'm going to have to do. What materials can I read to help them show the connection between the world and what we think of as monks? Ah, got it. So what I, if, if I understand this question uh, uh, it, correctly, it, yeah. there is sometimes a disconnect for people 
uh, because of the dual meaning of the word monk. Mm -hmm. um, because it can refer to a member of a religious order like Benedictine monks, um, uh, but it can also refer to uh, a member of um, certain Buddhist orders and other orders in East Asia that perform martial arts. Right. And so that, that creates kind of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. The monk class is, is specifically for the martial artists. Mm -hmm. It is not meant to also represent like Franciscans or you know, Dominicans. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the presence of these martial arts experts, in what uh, appears to be uh, a sort of Western setting, keep in mind that in the real world, uh, there was far more cultural interplay between uh, the East and West than people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the early centuries, uh, uh, Clement of Alexandria, I believe, Oh God! I'm now having. To, I'm dipping in my mind into my ancient world history. It might have been in the 300s. Well, you pulled don't, that name out, don't, so I'm impressed. Don't, already. don't don't quote me on this. <laughs> Remember, in my previous life, this was my uh, this was my academic specialty. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, I believe, in the 300s. But again, don't quote me on the date. Uh, writing uh, in you know in the Mediterranean area actually writes about uh, the Buddha at that point, point. Uh, and there was. Uh, a lot of travel going on in that time. Um, just think about also the conquests, uh, you know, Alexander the Great going to the east. Remember, any time one culture reaches out to another, whether through peace or war, mm -hmm. almost always that creates a cultural conduit, which means then people from that place they travel to are probably following that conduit back and traveling the other direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, even uh, also early Christian monasticism, there are writings uh, that refer to the monks practicing the breathing techniques that were used by Brahmins in India in the ancient world. So even some early Christian monks were aware of practices in India. Hmm. Uh, so there were not the there were not the uh, uh, the sort of cultural walls around different peoples that people often imagine. You know, it's really easy to oversimplify the ancient world and think everyone was in sort of like a little cultural playground when in fact the, the cultural barriers were very porous and, and people were seasoning each other's cultures and learning from each other's cultures all the time. And I suppose the, uh, to, to carry it into the Forgotten Realms, and even more so in a fantasy setting, absolutely, where this would necessarily take place. Because keep in mind that in the Forgotten Realms, uh, just as one example, I could say similar things about Eberron or any of our other official settings, um, that you not only have people who are traveling around in, using the same means that uh, humans did in our world in the Middle Ages, but they also have airships, they have teleportation, uh, they can hop on uh, the backs of friendly dragons or on griffins. Or dinosaurs. Uh, so uh, you are even more likely in a D&D world to see people from far off lands than mm -hmm. I think you would, would have been in our own world. Uh, so I think it's very easy to imagine uh, people uh, from very different cultures, wandering into each other's towns uh, in the Forgotten Realms uh, and other D&D worlds, mm -hmm. and learning from each other and adventuring with each other and sometimes driving each other crazy. <laughs> uh, well, I think that might be a, a nice note to, to start wrapping things up. Uh, we're here at the top of the hour. Uh, I'll, I'll forego some of the other questions for, for next time, which I dearly love. And, so we, have, and we have a lot here. We have here. a lot. So, th so yes, thank you. We, we will not uh, uh, forget these questions. We archive them. We compile them. And maybe we'll do a, a special grab bag episode uh, yeah. and just do questions next time. Because yep. uh, I, too, want to find out what happens to an old gelatinous cube. Does it dry up? Does it crystallize? <laughs> <laughs> so so with, I can answer that one real quick. If we haven't... Uh, 
if we haven't told you in the monster manual what happens to that gelatinous cube yeah. uh, when it gets old, then it is up to the DM. Uh, so <laughs> DMs, you can have your crystallized gelatinous cubes, maybe some of them liquefy, mm. maybe part is crystallized, another part is liquefied. Now I want to run this in my game. <laughs> I have a, whole, have a whole society of gelatinous cubes in different states of development. Right. Uh, Clearly we should add water to this powder, but yes. what happens if we do? Oh, yes. it's a, actually a gelatinous cube that's all, come to life. Also imagine Imagine a dungeon where the structure is composed of gelatinous cubes, mm -hmm. uh, where they have they have been. I mean, they they they're, they're in such convenient shapes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and just all stacked nicely <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as always, uh, thank you so much for watching, everyone. We appreciate the questions in chat. Uh, we will get to even more of them next time. Uh, thank you to our followers and subscribers, and as always, to our moderators as well. The uh, work is very much appreciated. The participation is, is very much appreciated as well. I, I do want to call out to, to everyone in chat. Uh, we, we wouldn't do this if, if you weren't here watching and, and uh, interacting with us, so thank you very much for spending an hour of your time uh, with Jeremy and myself. Uh, stay tuned. At 3.30, we do have D&D news coming up, and we do have episode 101 of Dice Camera Action. Mm -hmm following this weekend's special crossover event with Acquisitions Incorporated. So uh, we'll get the archives of those videos up, I believe, on both uh, Penny Arcade and uh, the D&D channels as well in the days ahead. Uh, we have San Diego Comic-Con coming up this weekend. Uh, we'll be doing a bit of interviews down there. And then in two weeks, uh, we'll be down in L.A. on July 28th for a special live stream event. Uh, Luke Gygax is organizing Founders and the Legends Day. Uh, you can find out more information on that on the D&D website. Uh, there's our handy-dandy logo up uh, right now uh, on the screen. So we'll be doing three games during the day on July 28th, so please do consider tuning in then. We'll also be tying the games into our Extra Life charity. Um, it's been a great charitable program for us to be involved with. Uh, and we decided to do it even more throughout the year, and, and in addition to the one game day event in November. Uh, so we'll be uh, collecting donations uh, throughout the games on July 28th as well. So, uh, in any case, Jeremy, thank you for for joining us once again. Always and, uh, fun. We'll see you in two weeks. Yep. Two weeks. I'll be back. Day. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>